I've been thinking a lot about saving the world lately. Really? Me too. What did you have in mind? You know, energy is a huge issue. I was wondering what your thoughts are on the one of the biggest problems facing energy in the world today. Well, I think there's a lot of great technology for generation, but I think unless there's a good way to store that energy, mm -hmm. they're going to have a hard time scaling that up. And it would be even better if you could store that energy in synthetic fuels instead. You know, water is abundant, and you can split water into hydrogen. So do you think we can do this with solar energy? Absolutely. There's a field called solar water splitting, where they use these things called photoelectrochemical cells to convert solar energy into hydrogen fuel. And the way they work is they absorb sunlight to form hydrogen gas. I hear it's challenging to engineer PECs that are inexpensive, efficient, and stable. Any idea how to make them better? Well, so conventional wisdom says that these should operate at room temperature, but I'm not convinced that this is the only approach. I think heating these up could really help. But that sounds like a lot of energy. So you can actually get all this heat for free because solar concentrators have been shown to get your cells above 400 degrees Celsius. But why heat them up in the first place? That's a good question. So kinetically, your reactions get a lot faster as you increase temperature. And thermodynamically, it actually takes less energy to split water. So here we have a plot for iron oxide. And what you can see is by increasing the temperature from just 10 degrees to 70 degrees, we see an increase in the photocurrent of over 50%. That's great, but how high can we go? If we heat it up much more, the water will evaporate and the PC won't work anymore. Exactly. That's why you need a whole different device design to make this work. Here's how that could look. So the main idea here is the same as it was for a liquid PEC, but instead of having water conducting your ions, you have a solid electrolyte instead. These can only conduct at elevated temperatures, so they're perfect for this application. You can reach 15% solar to hydrogen efficiency if you operate between 350 to 500 degrees Celsius. So now we're at elevated temperatures. We will need different catalysts that are stable under these conditions. We're very interested in the surface of these catalysts. You know, this is the front line of electrochemical activity. So with such incentive to go to elevated temperature, what we need now is to develop a new device platform for solar water splitting. Well, that was the most productive three minute chat I've ever had. All right, let's go save the world. We're going to now turn the, turn the uh, conversation to be about clean energy. And so uh, what we're gonna talk about during this segment are some cross currents in clean power and we're going to ask whether there are some inflection points that may be in front of us. And I'm not going to give a forecast. There's only going to be one slide that is forward looking because it's pretty, pretty dangerous to forecast. But I really do want to ask the question as to whether or not uh, we're really close to some things that could be discontinuous. So the numbers are just in. This is from last year. Uh, Investment in clean energy is at record levels. Uh, this is uh, solar and wind. And so a couple of things. One, it's 300 and, uh, about $350 billion. So that's a big number, but maybe a small number when you look at the uh, global energy investment. The other thing you would observe is that this growth, while it's good growth, is still a linear relationship. So sure. Uh, Policy has made a difference in terms of this ramp up in uh, investment in clean energy, but it's also been about very significant declines in costs, and this is obviously a, ch a chart of declines in, in, in PV, but it's also been true in wind and batteries uh, and really every other clean energy technology. Costs have declined very dramatically, and the thing about it is the more that's made, the cheaper it becomes. And so I want you to really think about the fact that the renewable energy sector is still a very small sector relative to the overall power market. I want you to think about how scale can have some dramatic effects on further cost reductions. So, of course, the question is, what's going to happen now with uh, natural gas being at record lows? Is this, how big of a headwind is this to uh, the adoption of clean energy? And so, it's true that uh, natural gas has had a, a very major effect on displacing coal in central and big power plants. But the interesting thing is when you look at the electricity sector, and this is New York State, there really is a middle town, New York. Uh, in, in red, uh, you can see a decline in generation costs, and that's been because of the uh, effect of natural gas for generation. But the blue line is the cost of delivery. It's the cost of transmission and distribution. And those costs continue to go up. So in fact, to the customer, electricity costs are higher and getting higher still. So in the last 
10 years in New York State, we spent $17 billion on the electricity system and the infrastructure. In the next 10 years, it's going to be $30 billion. So it's interesting. You have the cost of distributed energy solutions going down and the cost of traditional production and distribution of energy in the traditional way going up. It's not a surprise that there are some people in the electric, electric utility industry wondering about the future of the business model. So the other thing is uh, distributed energy isn't just about solar. It came up in the earlier panel. These are pictures of different technologies that use natural gas to produce energy around customers, including the potential to provide uh, using natural gas to produce electricity at a residential level. So the impact of natural gas may be less about what it's going to do with renewable energy and more about what it's going to do to disrupting the traditional way that, uh, that we've been uh, distributing and, and the, uh, excuse me, uh, the traditional way that power is produced and distributed. So this chart is a busy chart. Uh, it's a chart which shows the adoption rates of technology uh, over long periods of time. And so one of the things you see is that uh, recent, recent technology adoptions have, trends have been accelerating. So I don't want to be naive. Uh, I understand that uh, solar and other uh, uh, innovative technologies uh, are different in many respects. We talked about storage. Uh, some of the other recent technologies are not commodities. In addition to that, you don't have the benefits yet, although that may be changing, that uh, it's not IT related. But nonetheless, we just should pause and think about uh, making extrapolations based upon uh, linear growth rates. And the other thing that I would want to caution is when you look at this chart, if you look at the very bottom of it, and see that actually it took 10 years for cell phones and PCs before they had this dramatic takeoff. And so when we look back in the adoption of, of innovative technologies, it's, we don't remember that period where it was growing, but it was still very small. But once it achieved a certain penetration rate, growth rates were very different. And this is the forward-looking chart. And this is from the IEA, which is, frankly, not necessarily uh, always been uh, a bull on renewable energy. And this just shows that every year they made a forecast, they were wrong. And every year they rev revised the forecast upwards. And the last thing I'd say about this is I want you to think about the effect of dramatic growth rates on a power sector where growth rates are measured in tenths of a percent, meaning very slow growth rates. And I make the same point here. When we look at the growth of electric vehicles, everybody says, well, they're not growing very fast. Just have to put it in context of this period of some years before you have dramatic growth. Now, in spite of the growth or the potential growth, it doesn't seem like investors are necessarily uh, buying into uh, the growth, and uh, this probably uh, the average kind of overstates some of the uh, uh, spectacular problems that have existed in some companies. There have been, Abengoa went bankrupt, so other companies have lost quite a lot of their market cap. But then the question would be, when you look at this chart, which is overall growth in stock market returns, we went through this period in the beginning around 1980 to 2000 where stock market returns were twice historic averages. And we've kind of been bouncing around since then. And for you investors in the room, you know, we may be back to a very low growth return environment for maybe from now on. And so if we're in that kind of environment, what's the connection between low growth and investment in renewable energy projects, which can be really very attractive, pay stable yields, and can changes in how the investment world, which is going to need to change because it's been built for a world of very high returns, how that's going to have the chance, perhaps, of accelerating the growth in clean energy. So 
Judge Brandeis talked about states being a laboratory of democracy. And you have wide divergence in state policies. So in Nevada is, uh, even though it has pretty good sun, is um, made dramatic changes in opposition to growth in the solar industry. And many states have uh, turned away from support of renewable energy. But other states, say New York, have gone the other direction. And we don't have the solar resources of, of Nevada, but we recognized those trends before about uh, increasing uh, costs of traditional power generation and declining costs of distributed solutions and decided that that's not good public policy if we just step back and let that go because we see that there are, that there are uh, not only cost and affordability issues, there are resiliency issues and economic growth potential for making a change in energy policy. And frankly, we're not going to attract, we don't believe, the next generation of, of talented people if we don't have a clean energy economy. So we heard this morning from Pew that looks like, uh, at least in terms of their polling, that this is a partisan issue and remains a partisan issue. I don't know if that's right or not. Uh, this is a Yale poll on the left, which shows that actually there has been some change in what people think about climate change. But nonetheless, we have this odd combination, which has gone on in the South, the Green Tea uh, Coalition, which involves, as you would expect, the Tea Party that's teamed up with environmental uh, uh, groups to promote solar, because the people in the Tea Party uh, don't like to get their power from those big utilities, but would rather control their own. So with that, Fred, I'll start with you and ask you how much you think policy and public attitudes are changing. Well, thanks, Richard. That was a great presentation. And before anybody else does, thank you for what you're doing in New York with REV. That is, uh, the whole idea of reinventing the utility model is really important to this country. So I congratulate you for your leadership. Five years ago, uh, when this forum was uh, born, solar and wind were looked at as pretty exotic sources, impractical and costly. And today, um, I'm driving along on the highway and I see a wind turbine. I look at my neighbor's roof, I see a solar panel. I go to Walmarts, I see solar panels on the roof. Uh, people's opinions have changed because they're now seeing the turbines and the panels. And the opinion, the new opinion, as we convene here today in 2016 is, this is an affordable, everyday source of energy. And I think that is very helpful to policy. Um, beyond that, we see um, the price um, coming down so dramatically. It's been referenced several times today. The panels are 80% less. The soft costs still are um, an issue, especially in residential situations. But even in all in, the installation costs are down 50% in the last five years. That changes people's attitudes. The other thing I think that has made people's attitudes more supportive of good policy in this area is the job implications. <coughs> Last year, 20% more jobs in the U.S. in the clean energy uh, arena. But it wasn't just one year. It was 20% more than the year before, and that year was 20% more than the year before. And jobs, too, more, probably more than anything else in the United States, drive policy. So um, the big obstacle, though, in policy, as you know as well as anyone, is we still have governmental red tape. We still have bureaucratic structures designed to protect incumbent utilities, which deprives consumers of the freedom to choose. And uh, those policies, we should um, join hands, whether with the Green Tea Party or everyday Republicans, Democrats, anyone who cares about good government, and get rid of that red tape um, so that this market um, can reach its natural potential. So Dave, David, what do you see going on with customers? Well, I mean, uh, to, to, to uh, add to Fred's point, the, the, what I go seeing 
going on with customers is they're, they're in many states they're not being given the right to actually um, uh, do what they want, which is you know put solar on their roof. I mean, in my time in the electric industry, which is we got to admit it's a pretty boring product, uh, but but solar is really the first thing that's captured the imagination, you know, uh, of the the populace. But it's very uneven, as you say, by state. I mean. You mentioned Nevada, but the, the sunshine state of Florida, putting solar on your roof is essentially illegal. Uh, and that's because of the activity of the incumbent uh, utility in the state. So um, what we are seeing, with, we've got the technology and we have the technology at the price point. And I know that there are a lot of people in the room that are from the oil and gas side of uh, of the industry, and you probably don't spend a lot of time thinking about electricity. And what I would ask you to think is, imagine if everyone in suburban America could plant an energy plant in their backyard and produce enough BTU content during the year and turn it into a liquid fuel that they could, they could power their cars and not have to uh, rely on your trillion dollar infrastructure from your EMP all the way through your refineries, your, your gas stations and all. That's, as, that's what the electric industry faces today. Um, it's an existential threat to the way that electricity is produced and delivered in the country. The problem we have is a business model problem, though, because the companies that currently uh, dominate the space really are not in a position to benefit from the new technology. So they have absolutely no inducement, uh, and there is no reason to give them an inducement to, um, uh, you know, to encourage it because, uh, because the electric sector, unlike the oil and gas sector, is set up a, 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 on a monopoly basis. And, and a decision of a person to put solar on their roof is not something that's a natural monopoly. In fact, the biggest uh, risk that I think someone that's doing home solar faces is not competition from the incumbent utility. It's competition from the fact that putting solar panels on the roof is actually a very simple thing to do. People may just go down to uh, Home Depot and do it themselves. But, the, but it's not something that, that a regulated monopoly uh, needs to deal with. So I think the, the business model in the electric space is going to change completely. And you alluded to a point, which I think is the great secret of that no one sort of talks about in the energy world so much, is that there's 125 million homes in America, private homes, and virtually all of them are tied to the electric system. There's 40-some million homes in America that are also tied to the natural gas distribution system. Why do those 45 million American homeowners have to pay for two expensive energy delivery systems in their house? I mean, I know because I'm in the industry that natural gas is $2.30 per million BTU. Why in central New Jersey am I still paying $12? Because every, every time the commodity price goes down, the people that control the transmission distribution spend more money so that the rate to the customer doesn't ever go down. And so the American people haven't been given the benefit of low commodity prices but, uh, in the electricity sector. And I think that just and that's going to change. And the question, and that change is going to occur, I think, now because of solar. And as was said in the breakfast this morning, what's happened in solar in the last few years in terms of where the technology and the price has happened is about to happen in, in, in energy storage. And you put solar and energy storage together on a distributed basis, and it's game over for life as we know it for the big power companies in the United States. So, Ahmad, what's, I know you have a view on this. <laughs> well, uh, so first of all, uh, I want to echo what Fred said. Thank you, Richard, for your leadership in New York. It's not only teaching other states in the U.S. what to do, but around the world. And I, I go in many places, and they're looking to your innovation. So it's great what you're doing. Really, really good, good job. I want to actually talk a little bit about the cost structures and, and how it's evolving. So first of all, when we talk about solar, for example, and wind has similar things, has, the cost has three elements in it. Number one, how much sunlight do you get in a given place? Number two, what is the risk in that place, albeit foreign exchange risk or country risk or environmental risk, whatever it is, the risk of, of, of doing an execution there. And the third is the cost of equipment and construction. These are the three costs. And if you look as, as time progress, in Germany in 2007 and 8, it used to cost around $7 to install a uh, power plant, a watt, $7 a watt. And they, you have 1,100 hours a, a year. That, that's what it is. Today in India, you can construct that for 80 cents a watt, and you have 2,000 hours. But you have more 
country risk because of foreign exchange and, and other, other risks. Because of that today, solar in India is competitive with imported coal at $65 uh, per metric ton of coal. It's like seven cents a kilowatt hour. Coal is around six. Uh, that's how you should see it. So the cost has declined tremendously. Uh, today, Richard, I was very disappointed with some projections about Germany, almost like giving the impression because Germany did not use natural gas and used renewables, somehow it did not improve the carbon footprint. And I think that, that whole analysis and how Germany is paying two to three times more than the US is wrong. So let me give you some the real data since we operate in, in those markets. Germany has the cost of uh, retail is around 25 to 30 cent euro cents per kilowatt hour. 20 of that is taxes. It's nothing to do with generation. And that's why people want to use a battery because they don't want to buy from the grid because they have to pay that tax, which is two thirds. The cost actually of renewables is like one cent per euro per kilowatt hour. So to give that impression that somehow using renewables and making strategic mistakes, and that's like Germany 10 years ago, let alone now the cost of solar have declined tremendously. Uh, so that's how I want to tell you that. The other thing is around the world now we see that we are signing contracts with corporations without a government support. It started in Chile. So Chile you get 2,900 hours, which is a tremendous amount of hours per year. And since the cost of electricity there is high, because they don't have other uh, natural resources, but solar it is, uh, we're able to sign contracts with mining companies who are very conservative to use solar. I see also a similar trend in battery storage. Battery storage for me is like five years behind solar. We were able to reach certain levels of cost structure and penetration in solar uh, five years ago that storage is starting to see it today. And we're starting to see it at the edges of the industry. We believe as of a year ago that we should never build another peaker plant in the United States or around the world because the cost of storage, if you buy batteries from Tesla or LG Chem, or Samsung or BYD, you can build a power plant that eliminate a peaker plant and without even assessing the value of absorbing electricity from elsewhere, just by producing. So it's very exciting. The final point I wanna make is we have to differentiate between public market acceptance of, of uh, renewable energy companies and the private market. The private market today is 250 billion a year. So someone is making a lot of money. When we have offered our portfolio in Minnesota two months ago to be bought, we got 50 offers, 50 offers. In Chile, we had 20 offers. However, our stock and the public markets, how they view the uh, solar industry or renewable energy is another thing altogether. And we shouldn't confuse both. Okay, I wanna come, I wanna come back to the investor stuff in a couple of minutes, but I wanna, wanna, I wanna bring this first part to, uh, a pointed conclusion, if I can, because I think that uh, I think there's there is debate about how much innovation we need in technology to get to this new clean energy decarbonized future uh, versus is the technology kind of good enough to make meaningful progress and versus the question of how much uh, I'm I guess that's, that's, maybe that's really the question I'm trying to ask, and how much is the obstacle really about policy as opposed to the technology? I guess that's really the question that I'm asking. It is really a policy issue because if you look at the cost tra trajectory, for example, of solar, we will reduce the cost in our company by 50 to 60% by 2020. I'm not talking about projections of other people's discussion. So what we need, uh, Richard, is a lot of help, which something you try to do is, ML is, is becoming MLPs so that we allow significant amount of investment to flow in into the industry. That kind of policy we need. The protection from politics at sta in states. If we have that protection and really be data-driven and fact-based driven instead of politi politically driven or try and protect the, the current utilities in, in, in those states, that's the protection we need. So Richard, it also going back to the first point, from a customer point of view, um, uh, right now, uh, home solar is 2% uh, market penetrated in the United States. Uh, California is 55 to 
of the overall market. So, and I think that makes California 3% or 4% market penetration, certainly below 5%. Um, you know, 56 million homes at, at 25 to 30 thousand dollars, you know, cost. That's it's over a trillion dollar market. I mean, it's a, it's a huge potential market, but but still the customer experience. I think there needs to be improvement from both sides. First of all, from the industry's perspective, putting solar on your on the roof of your house is not a particularly good customer experience right now. It's it's the sort of 2015 equivalent of waiting for the cable guy. And very nice. It takes over a hundred days and in a society that's based on almost immediate gratification, doing anything, making a, a consumer decision on day one, and it takes 100 days for it to actually be fulfilled, that's very frustrating to the American public. And, and, and there's a lot of things that play into that. So the customer experience um, has to be improved. But I, I come back to the industry structure. You know, we, we were all very happy, you know, 10, 15 years ago watching our Trinitron TVs. But you know the industry came along with the flat screen, you know, plasma, and they promoted the hell out of it and got people who were perfectly happy with what they had to drop a few thousand dollars to get the next best thing. When the incumbent industry does not want to encourage, you know, the next day of customer acceptance, you got to figure out how to do that. I mean, that's that's the sort of challenge we face if we're going to make a sea change uh, from from where we are now. So I, I want to go back to you then, Fred. Again, because what we're hearing is is the challenge associated with incumbency and the fact that uh, that that government, many governments are are helping to preserve that that incumbency. So, what do you, how do you see this changing? Well, I think um, we need leadership for sure from some of the existing incumbents in the utility industry. They need to uh, see the future and, as was said this morning, decide that they can profit from it. Um, but I think we also need policy. This week has been a big week for these issues. Um, earlier this week on Monday in Nature, uh, there was an article uh, by Professor Clack and others showing that with existing technologies, to your question, we could get a 78% reduction in the carbon footprint from uh, the electric grid. And previous papers have raised a lot of eyebrows and questions. This one, um, I'm sure, will be scrutinized too. But to us, um, the Environmental Defense Fund, our initial read is um, this is uh, really good work. And one of the things that it uses is creating wider wider markets and by using a, um, direct current voltage lines, uh, so um, which have less resistance. So this is a really important paper. The other thing that happened this week is the Supreme Court ruled 6 to 2 to uphold FERC Order 745. And what that means, for those of you who don't follow each and every FERC order, <laughs> is that um, demand-side management, which goes to the question of uh, if you need these peaker plants, um, has been affirmed as a way to satisfy peak demand and will now be a tool uh, that we can increase the use of in the United States, um, which is tremendous. Already, uh, just 2014, during the polar vortex, we didn't have blackouts because of this tool. Um, and it's reduced, in the Northeast, um, customer bills by about $13 billion because new infrastructure doesn't need to be built. You can just pay existing um, users of electricity like uh, Marriott and um, Walmart and others that sell into this market. They sell reductions in power. It's just a common sense thing that the Supreme Court is going to allow to go forward. And it's an example of a big policy that makes a big difference for the grid. And so I just want to follow up. Thanks for raising that issue, because uh, one of the comments I made before was this issue of, of IT and the acceptance of some of these other innovative technologies has had a, a, under, its, under its basis sort of IT economics. So when we think about the issue of, of, of demand response and load control, that is very, is, implies a lot of IT. And so when we think about, sometimes when we think about the intermittency of, of renewables, we, our first reaction is, well, we gotta have storage 
but it may be that there are other solutions for that, right? There's another type of storage. I mean, uh, Arun Majunder put it better than anyone else I know, which he said, um, in the past, or so far, electric power has helped uh, computing power. Going forward, we need computing power to help electric power. Thank you, Arun, for that. <laughs> All right, so let's go, let's go to this investor question, because uh, I think uh, you both have had issues with your investors. And so what, what, what do you take away from your experiences? Well, I'll, I'll go uh, first. Please go first. <laughs> well, the one thing, and you allude I to it. About, I thought about being more diplomatic. Well, you, you allude a couple of things to it. I mean, one is in a mature economy like the United States, public company investors in any part of the energy space are not growth investors. They're, they're either invested because they're, they're, they're investing in the companies as a proxy for the commodity, and we've seen what's happened to every energy commodity the last few years, so people have lost money on that. Or because it, they're value investors and they're going for a dividend. Renewables, uh, particularly solar, doesn't fit into that right now. Renew you know, imagine a solar panel. It's all the money's up front, and you take your return over 20 years with zero marginal cost of production. So, so it doesn't fit. And I can tell you in the electric industry, as you say, you know, a big year in the electric industry in the United States is when growth is 2%. Uh, the markets, traditional investors just don't know how to comprehend a industry that's growing its, its top line at 100% you know, per year. So I think there's just a natural disconnect. Uh, what I would say happened in the, say to my company where we're trying to transform from a, from a conventional power company into a renewable company is there is no public market for internal transformation. And this, and I think about what we're trying to challenge, do in retrospect. And again, the, the oil industry um, it has the, it would face the same two issues that that I would face. Imagine if there's someone deep inside an oil company's you know long-term strategy department who says, "Yeah, the world is never going to allow us to burn all this oil that we keep you know putting into our reserves, spending hundreds of billions of dollars. So we have to turn ourselves into a different company." If, if the head of a major oil company, if Rex Tillerson went from the investors of the world and said, you know, we're not going to do this EMP thing anymore, we're, we're, we're going to be an energy software company, you know, the, the Wall Street would say, you're out of your mind. You know, we own your stock because you're good at punching holes in the earth. Now go back to punching holes in the earth until we tell you to do something different. Uh, and, and the second thing, there's nothing that one of the major oil companies could do as a matter of scale, that would match what they're doing right now. So my company, you know, we consider ourselves to be the first or second largest solar power company in the United States, and was less than 10% of our overall power generation. And so it never mattered to investors. Uh, and so I think that is, a, you know, so uh, um, Ahmed's problems may be different, but the transformation thing I think is a challenge as to how you get the six trillion dollar a year global energy industry into doing something in a completely different way because the market wants you to keep doing what you're doing, just keep doing it a little bit better every year. Yeah, so I'll, I'll say two things. Um, number one, the clean energy industry in general has declined over the last 12 months with the energy markets. Be it's nothing to do with competition between oil and solar. Actually, I have never seen I've never lost a deal because someone said, I'm going to use diesel. So just never. And this is like we have, we're negotiating 60 gigawatts around the world. So we have none of that. Where the, energy, the industry lost a lot of uh, value is because the investor is the same. And many of our investors are investors in oil. And many of their LPs start pulling their money. So they had to sell our shares and everybody else's shares in the same token. So that's like the overall industry. So another situation is more severe because a self-inflicted wound is nothing to do with investors. This has to do with my decisions, and it's as follows. In the power industry, or, or solar is one, there's three elements to making money. You develop projects, you construct them using technology or, and crews, and you own them. The value in the long run is always in developing and owning. That's where the value is. In a short period in any industry, technology always is the barrier. So up front, people always celebrate technology companies. But after that, it goes away, and the business model becomes where you make money. So what happened is I wanted us to own projects. I really did. 
And the approach to do it, I used public companies it's called yield codes, like MLPs or REITs. And at a time when I was growing very fast and being celebrated for it and getting significant amount of traction and creation, creation of value, the market shut down. And I basically got caught in, in, a, in a very tough situation where I'm trying to issue equity in these yield codes to absorb all these deals when my investor had no money. And I recognized that during an IPO process I'm doing. The next day I figured out because I actually bought and sold commodities, five commodities in my career. So I kind of know the dynamic. When someone wants to buy something from you, they cajole you, they love you, they hug you. When they don't want to buy something, they listen politely. And we got listened politely. A year before, for half a billion dollar raise, we got $11.7 .7 billion demand. The year after, we didn't have that. And from that, then we went into a, a, a vicious cycle. Since I can sell my projects to my yield codes, then Sun Edison then became in jeopardy. When Sun Edison became in jeopardy, then the yield codes became under even more pressure because now the parent company is, is weaker. And that's the self-inflicted root of Sun Edison. The other clean, 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 clean tech companies are down 50%, just like everybody else. And I think once the, the funds get refreshed, either by shutting down and new funds emerge, I think the clean tech, in my opinion, companies will rise much faster than fossil fuels because the growth trajectory is higher. And the other thing I would tell you is, 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 is you have $250 billion invested in solar and wind every year. And we're talking about European utilities, private equity funds, pension funds from Canada, Korea, Japan, and Europe. They're pumping a lot of dollars in it. So I'm not worried about investors investing in, in, in clean tech at all, at all, actually. And, how do, and again, back to the point about yields. If we are in a low yield environment, does that have an effect on you? Is this, in other words, if we're headed into a, a general market environment where financial returns are going to be very modest, how does that affect your business? You see, that's, that's the thing that I missed in a big way. I always actually looked at history because I used to read history a lot, right? But in this one, I didn't read enough. If you look at REITs, they trade at 4% yield, and from time to time, they go through a dislocation, and they go up to 10, 15% yield, and then they come down a year or two later. And then for four or five years, they, they, they run at 4%. MLPs run at 6% because it's a shorter tenor, fuel risk, so on and so forth. In 1998, in 2002, now, now I'm doing the debug, right? Like, how did I miss it? In 1998, in 2002, during the Lehman Brothers, there was dislocations, and today, too, in MLP and REIT space. You can see their yields going up. When the yield is up, that means it is harder to issue equity. So we think that the yield will come down because renewables have few things better than MLPs. Let me tell you what they are. Longer tenor, 20 years versus five to seven years. No fuel risk and higher growth in the future because the shale revolution in US is behind us a little bit, uh, like started in 2005 and, and so. So because of that, the yield should be lower than MLPs, but maybe a little bit higher than REITs. That means it will be around 5%. That's our own view. But it's going to take a year or two to, to clean up and get back to, to steady state. OK, very good. So I've, I've got a couple of questions, but they're very, very, very specific. So. I'm, I'm sorry for the people that ask the question. I'm not going to ask these questions. And instead, I'm going to ask each of you to, in the three minutes and 40 seconds left, each of you to give your, your parting shots. Thoughts? <laughs> Brad, you wanna, who wants to start? Sure, I'm happy to start. Um, I think the future of clean energy is bright, but I do think, as we've discussed, there's obstacles that have to be um, cleared out of the way. I think this does relate to natural gas, as Sally Benson and others have said earlier, because Sally, um, as Sally said, natural gas is such a great fuel to power up um, flexibly um, generation to deal with intermittency. Um, on the natural gas point, I do want to um, mention how gratifying it has been for me to sit here all day and hear the methane leaks um, conversation, because um, it has gotten into the spotlight a lot more over the last few years. Remember a few years ago, I was here with Doug Suttles and uh, Noble um, and Anna Darko talking about what we did in Colorado to bring down leak rates. The one thing I do want to just use a, a moment to do is say that if you had been here all day, you might have gotten the impression this is problem solved. 
and that's not at all the case. I think inadvertently, um, one of the statistics used was the leakage from the oil and gas industry is 1% of the leakage in the United States. The correct fact is 29% of the oil and gas industry. Uh, another thing that was said was that um, the leak rate went down as production has gone up. Actually, the leak rate overall is up 3% in the oil and gas industry from 2012. Um, so, uh, and the EPA inventory, which those figures are from, we now know because of Adam Brandt at the Precord Institute, because of studies at Harvard, because of the studies that EDF has done with industry, the EPA inventory is 50% lower than the actual leak rate. So this is not yet um, at all solved. What's a little bit disappointing to me is despite the great success here in Colorado, we haven't seen um, the oil companies support using the same approach nationwide. So with the exception of a few states, Wyoming, Pennsylvania, we are not um, on a track to um, solve this problem. My, my minute. So uh, what I would say, just to sort of uh, try and pull it all together, I think it's ironic that what I would say is the traditional energy industry, which I'd call the 20th century energy industry, has dra dragged down the, the, uh, the birthing 21st century energy industry in terms of being renewable driven. And the opportunity that exists right now, I actually believe that the energy company of the 21st century is going to be born within the next couple of years. And, and it'll be, and I think it'll probably be private equity, maybe v VCs, maybe hedge funds, but it's gonna be solar driven, it's gonna be distributed, but it's gonna be a lot more than just solar power because at the end of the day, one of the big risks that the solar industry hasn't overcome is their products is, is pretty much a commodity already and a simple commodity, by far the, as an owner operator, the easiest way to make electricity is by a solar panel. There's nothing to it, right? You just slap it up on the, stick it at the sun and it starts to make electricity. It's like, compared to a nuclear power plant, it's at the opposite end of the, the spectrum. And so for all the young people out there, I see some young people in uniform here and the Stanford students, I say, this is where, this is where you wanna be in terms of your career. This is where you can, uh, you can make a fortune and you can save the world. And, uh, and it's gonna have solar and it's gonna have storage. And, and then, but what we haven't talked about here yet is the software that's gonna tie it all together and make a, a very, very uh, disaggregated, distributed energy system work. I mean, we've ta we talked about load, there'll be load shifting inside the household. You know, you don't need to have a huge battery pack in their basement, you just need to have enough to sort of you know, do your essential load. And what's your essential load at, at, at two o'clock in the afternoon, which is probably, a, or, or let's say seven o'clock at night, which will be around your kitchen, is not the essential load at two in the morning when it's the air conditioner in your bedroom. Uh, so we don't need to keep consuming electricity the way we can, but we do because we have a dumb system. But when it gets smartened up and all the kids from Stanford here know how to do this, then we will have a completely different system and I, and I think a much better and much more sustainable system as well. Well, I'll, I'll say uh, storage is the holy grail. I, I, I use it, we use it now in our company and we're starting to, to see it more and more. Uh, but I'll talk about electric vehicles. Electric vehicles, I have a Tesla. I, I, uh, I leased it actually. My, my son uh, criticized me for leasing it, not buying it. It's 258 mile range simplified way of lithium ion batteries, they're improving at 7% per year. That means the, for the same size battery, the density will improve by 2x in 10 years. That means a car can drive 500 miles without a recharge. And 10 years after that, it will be 1,000 miles. Who would buy an oil car with a 1,000 mile range? And then now it's like, I'm so obsessed with this. Every time I go somewhere, I ask people about it. So last, around a month ago, I was in China, I was meeting the deputy governor of a, of a province that has 55 million people and a $700 billion economy. And I asked him about it, what he thinks, and he says their strategy is to have 20% electric vehicles in his province out of all cars sold that year, in 2020. I actually used to say in 2010 after looking at, because I'm a semiconductor guy, so I looked at modules and everything, I used to say that China one day will be at 10 gigawatts a year of solar. And my Chinese friends used to laugh at me. Now they're at 24 gigawatts a year installation. 
it's my opinion that China one day will wake up and says effective immediately, it will be five years from now, 10 years from now, 50% of all cars are gonna be electric. You watch this, the battery costs in China based on the companies that we have visited are much lower than Korea and elsewhere. And I think once they see that, that moment, they're gonna enforce it, in, in my opinion. And that will disrupt all the forecasts that we talk about potentially. All right, on that, I wanna thank this great panel and thank you all.